just so I don't get my Twitch video deleted. Um, anyways, uh, welcome, welcome back. Uh, this is going to be a Twitch Prime edit. And what that means, or sorry, a Twitch edit. And so uh, what that means is this is going to be a free edit. One of the very rare things on the internet. So it won't be like super detailed. We're not going to be doing a full development edit. But because it's a free edit, this is going to be more instructive oriented. So this is going to be taking a look at this work and seeing how it can teach all of us something rather than saying, you know, like I would if this was a normal edit, you know, really breaking it apart and saying how can we make this work the best it can possibly be. We still want to do some of that, but this is going to be 90%, uh, hopefully for the benefit of the uh, editor. So let's go, uh, or for, the, for, for, for all of us, uh, because it's more of a instructive lesson. So this is by uh, Jay Krizzle. This is called Copeland's Fire. Um, so it looks like this is a short story. Um, so I kind of, because it's a little on the long side, so I usually only edit, uh, but it's in Courier, which helps. So I usually only edit 10 pages, but I might read a little fast towards the end so I can comment on the whole thing. We'll see what happens. It's The night's young. Okay. So, um, we are back now. That should work now. Let's see. That should work. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. So I started visiting Copeland after his parents died. I guess we were always friends. It was always, it always felt, we got a couple of always is there. I'm going to put this on suggesting. There's a lot of qualifiers. I know you're trying to do this for voice. Um, you know, even though qualifiers help develop voice because we use them in speech, um, try to only use the necessary since they do slow down. Yeah, so little clarifying things like that, like always felt more, more like, it just felt like we both orbited like you orbited a similar group of people that always remain in the opposite hemispheres from each other. I wish you could say that I didn't, that I did it out of an act of empathy. Uh, you know, this should just trim in some words. I did it, I did it out of empathy or to be there for a person who probably could use company. The reality of it though, is I felt obligated. I mean, I was the one who'd come across I was the one who had come across the accident. Come across is a bit, um, I would look for, get a better verb here. Um, the sentence Here, I'm going to get some glasses, because that's really bright. How do I turn down? I wish I had night mode. Does Google Docs have night mode? What is that sound? Is that the Google Chrome thing that I just installed? Oh, it's CNET being obnoxious. What a surprise. Come on, let's see. I'm gonna refresh. Hopefully, dark mode will work. Oh, thank. Oh, isn't that nice? Oh, wow, that's great. Oh, 
that's just like my eyes are revitalized. I'm going to get my little glasses though. Oh, I'm gonna have to get that for Firefox too. That's fantastic. All right. The smell sticks with me the most. The bouquet of gasoline, rubber, and plastic with end of meat, all feeling the same fire, was actually kind of pleasant on its own. It was only one paired with the violent and most likely excruciating deaths of two people who were probably decades away from a more natural end makes it a scent that haunted me. Nothing I could have done. I'm sure of that. Um. So, like, yeah, so... This is uh, going to be coming down to concrete uh, language. Using concrete language. Um, concrete language is always, um, is like, if possible, we feel like this is filtered. I want to So it's hard to describe, um, but this all feels a level removed, right? So think about this, and this is something it's it's really this is a hard concept to communicate to writers, uh, I think at least. Um, it's been difficult for me to grasp it, so it's it's obviously hard for me to, it's like hard for me to, it took me a long time to learn it, and it's taken me, it takes even longer to kind of like, I feel like getting a handle on it. Um, let me see if I can get this adjusted correctly, bloop. Look at how nice that looks now. Oh wow, that's beautiful. Uh, anyways, but yeah, so, this scene is a character describing a memory about an event. So that's three levels away from the event, right? So he's not remembering this right now. He's describing what it's like to remember this. So like one way to think about how to improve this is bringing it a level closer, which is just saying, okay, Maybe it's just him experiencing a memory of the event versus him describing what an experience of that memory of the event was like, right? So there's so many layers of abstraction happening that it's it blurs the language. One thing to really think about is how to zoom in to him actually experiencing a memory. Um why not actually have him experience his memory rather than have a description of what the memories and this is like kind of like show us his experience of a memory don't have him tell us what like and this comes down to, to zooming into scene memory is a tough thing to handle especially when you're adopting this telling a story type form where he's like well let me tell you because it's always going to skew you towards telling whenever your narrator or your, your first person character is narrating whenever he's describing the events that have happened to him. Dark mode is so good. I know it, it blew my mind. It's like, Oh, I can see <laughs> I'm not going blind. Oh, uh, well, how wonderful. Um, but yeah, so, so this is something really important to keep in mind for all writers. Maybe this will be one of the takeaways I put on the blog. Uh, when I kind of write up the little post summary of this is it's really, really, really important to, 
try to get as close to the action, as close to the scene as possible. Yes, there are some times when you will have to tell when you're going to want to tell. Um, but when you have an opportunity to inch closer to the concrete events of the scene, do that. Copeland only nodded when I warned him that I planned on visiting sometime after the funeral. I think he took me seriously, though. He had been hearing similar pleasantries. I don't think he took me seriously. Okay, we already kind of get this. This is already told. You already did a great job. Oops, I need to put it back on to suggesting. Um, um, So yeah, verbal doubling is usually when you don't trust the reader and you try to kind of re-describe something that's happening. So, food for thought. He had been hearing similar pleasantries all day. Dozens had promised to offer up anything he needed. Promised to offer is a bit verbose. Remember, shorten your verbs. This is a big verb. Um, I'm trying to shorten... In later edits, try to shorten um, or compress verbs. You know, dozens, you know, I could be like, Dozens offered support with anything. And it takes a few little, like, you know. Dozens had promised uh, to offer up anything if he needed it. Favors owed to his parents were now in his cash. Were, his, were now his to cash in. There wasn't a door that wasn't open. And he'd never have to buy his coffee, his own coffee again, if he could, own, if he could time out his visits. Right. The first time I drove up to his house, I thought all about those people... I promised him companionship and figured I could have just driven past and deep into the ranks of one of those unfulfilled claims. But Copeland would have held it against Copeland wouldn't have held it against me. He always seemed a type who didn't put much stock in words when it came to qualifying friendships. Probably the smartest satellite of our group. Um not really sure. I kinda get what this means. Like he's kinda like, um maybe offer Mm. Yeah. And yeah, I think the other thing is like, again, how do we get to the scene? Um, so yeah, this is kind of like what I'm writing up, but like the, the, the big goal here is we're getting a, and you're bumping into a common challenge in a first person narrator, um, is the narrator, when the narrator is the storyteller, when the narrator is the person describing the events, because the way we tell stories is like that. So if I was to tell my friend, be like, oh man, this guy's really great. He's a really cool dude. You'll like him, you know, but one night this and this and this happened, you know, that's the challenge here. The narrator is describing the properties, the attributes of Copeland, 
But the problem is, is that we are not able to experience them. We're just having to take him at his word, which is pretty much um, the weakest way of communicating a character's attributes. Oh, he didn't hold it against him. But, you know, how how do we know he doesn't hold it against people? How do we know all this stuff? So these are questions I think you really, really want to start um exploring is to say how can I visualize this you know it's sort of like you you always experience something much more powerfully when you go through it rather than someone saying like if someone you know if 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 you say you know Joe over there is the most generous person ever they'll say great good for Joe but if Joe comes up and gives you a a thousand dollars then you'll be like wow that guy is the most generous person ever so it's the difference i want to like experience getting a thousand dollars versus being told that he's super generous and that's kind of what's happening here we see that oh he wouldn't have held it against me he didn't seem to talk to put put much stock in friendships but these are all this person's super generous i want to see these attributes in scene and if it's coming later, then you may be able to cut all this stuff out or shorten it. I kept my promise and pulled up to the gravel driveway that led to his country home. I've been there a handful of times before. He was surprised nothing had changed. I'm not sure what I expected. The big shed throw to Copeland's parents peeked out, pulled in behind Copeland's truck. Um, <laughs> it wasn't the same type of fire scent as before. Nice. Great job using all the senses. Um... Yes, this is the first scene of the novel. So right now we've been in summary, summary, summary. This narrator has been summarizing and redacting all the information for us. Um, but now we get to actually be in a scene, hopefully, and make decisions for ourselves. The thing the reader really likes, at least the modern reader tends to, is they like the writer to bring them into a scene and let them make some of the judgments on who the character is and why. And it it, it makes it much the reader much more participatory in the act of reading. I'm going to grab a little orange. I'll be right back.
And it wasn't the same type of fire scent as before. Um, like, yeah, so, like, this is... So he's saying, as before, and I'm like, well, what type of fire scent? Um, you know, I think it's, this is more just reference. It wasn't the same type of fire scent as when his parents were lit on fire. I don't know what happened to them, but yeah. It was emerging from somewhere in the house in the shed, or it could have been coming from the building. It was just for the tell. Copeland? So he's still describing, describing, describing. There's so much. It's it's all interior. It's all filtered, filtered. So what's happening whenever that happens is the character is doing all the thinking for us. He's kind of taking the reins a little bit away from the reader. And that's possible, but then you'll want to... It's possible to pull off, but then you have to make that character's interior world deceptive and a place where the reader has to figure out the rules and to engage. So if you're not doing that, which this is him just kind of describing a scene. My imagination was something that I wanted to get a handle on for a long time. The scenes of Copeland's possible demise weren't as gruesome as the event had played across my mind. There was a math teacher's unfortunate run with the faculty, faulty chalkboard, and starting quarterback slow stroll. Wait, wait, wait. Mm, I'd often wonder if these things came to me because I'd been spared or ever seen anything like it. I don't know the corner, I saw my friend very much alive dragging a dead tree limb across the yard into a fire pit. Inside, the iron circle of a decent sized fire was a burning waist high. Copeland stopped when he saw me. He didn't do anything at first, but did eventually greet me with a small upward nod of his head. I responded with a slow raise of my right hand, an injury suffered during a sin of my high school scoop of my fingers in a traditional wave. All right, cool. So I want this. Okay. So this is good. This is a good grace note in a long novel. But in a short, short story, um, you know, I'm expecting this to come back in later. Yeah, so whenever you mention like a decent chunk of backstory, we're, we're like expecting it to factor back in down the road. So just food for thought. It's just saying, okay, as I'm reading this, what are some of the impressions that are going through? And a lot of that, so you can give a lot of concrete details and be like, oh, like my, my busted hand made me wave a little bit differently. But then if you pause the story and you give me backstory about it, you are, whether you're intending it or not, signaling to the reader that this is an important thing. You need to remember it. Um, so that's another really helpful use of backstory or like those little kind of asides is to say, oh, hey, hey, this is important enough to note on and it can feel like it's off the cuff, but we'll remember it. So it's sort of like in Telltale, whenever you do something silly, you know, they're like, oh, so and so will remember that. So same deal. Ophelia had always called it my lazy wave. I hoped it was enough. Copeland began breaking some of the smaller sticks from the bigger branch and tossed them into the flames. Some of them still had flourishes of dead leaves. 
Full flourishes of dead leaves. That's kind of a funny term, isn't it? On them. The fire ate those up and spat the undesirables out. So here, I'm just kind of going through. <sighs> yeah, so in this one, oops, whoa, whoa, I saved the, I don't, I don't want to save that HTML file. I don't want that. Delete. <laughs> But uh, yeah, remember this, the verb, the verb, the verb is really, really important. And when you're getting into scene and you're starting to describe the fire and all these things and impressions, the verb matters so much more. So really, really focus on getting that verb right. Um, and I think went is a weak verb when you could use drifted, floated, blah, 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 whatever. Um, so remember, you're always one of them, like the, the, the base clause of your sentence, the the subject verb core. That's really critical in terms of that sentence's feel. It makes everything. If a lot of the main ideas in your sentence are communicated elsewhere, like, you know, in a, in one of the independent or in one of the dependent clauses you've tacked onto it, it's going to not read as smoothly. So you're trying to get the most important actions of your sentence into the base clause, the noun verb, and then you're trying to make that noun verb as powerful and as descriptive as possible. Um, Yeah, maybe that'd be a fun writing project to try to tell a story with just nouns and verbs, nothing else. That'd be really hard. Because the descriptors matter, matter, but the noun verb is very powerful at the sentence level. The insects' orange spotted bodies camouflage them in living light so well it was impossible to tell what was birthed in the flames would simply come to admire it. I like this image. I like this image. Good image. Um, there were still no words from Copeland. He sat down on a wooden Aryan dock chair. Okay. Um, so we're just... You know, there's not much. I mean, we're about... Yeah, this is probably going to be a bigger note too, which is, you know, um, I wish I could highlight this. Maybe I can. I'm trying to highlight these big notes here. Did I do that? No, it doesn't matter. Yeah, well. So that's a big note. This is a big note. I'm trying to highlight my big notes so I can remember them. Uh, there are still no words from Copeland. Okay, this is some conflict, so yes, okay, we're getting some conflict here.
He sat down on a chair, pointed to his folded lawn, looked up and grabbed it. Not sure what unfolded. Hey, hey. I had a feeling that he knew why I'd come, or at least around where that reason lived. Um, okay, so this is, uh, I kind of wrote the note a little bit, but I wanted to, uh, I want to go into a little bit more detail here. So yeah, the, the, the issue with this dialogue that I'm seeing is, it's a little bit, hi, how are you? I am fine. We're doing good. There's no conflict. There's no driving forward. Um, so it's still like, in like, hey, hey, hi, how are you? So, I mean, that we maybe have a suggestion of suspicion. Um, you know, so that's good, you know. This suggestion of suspicion. But yeah, other than that, it feels very, very... Um, it's very scenic right now, and I'm not getting a, a big hook into the story that I want. Um, realizing we were becoming older, at least, I thought, made me smile. We didn't make plans. In lack of a strict request not to come back, so just an open invitation. We didn't say goodbye either. Well, I should, I guess. We didn't really. Whoa. Um, this is a confusing, odd, take a rewrite. Um, I should have guessed. Yep, I have a good one. It was the same interaction I'd heard my own father say, and I was sure that I had heard Copeland's as well. So are we, are we not using dialogue tags? No, we're not. Ugh. Da -da 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 -da. So it sounds like you're you maybe you're challenging yourself not to use dialogue tags. Maybe giving us a little bit of a gauge, you know, like I cleared my throat, you know, whatever. Or this is him, or that happened not too long ago, him. You can keep it really minimalist, but it just like gives us the markers of who's talking and like, you know, yeah. Yeah, some some food for thought there. Next time I stopped to see Copeland, the day's light had only just begun to reveal the hidden purples and crimsons of the sky. Um, yep, yeah, well, I should, I guess. It seemed much like what my own father say I was sure. Yeah, I don't know. Do we need this? I. It was the same direction I heard from my own father say... He might have even said the same thing as the first waves if he touched his wife's dark hair. Heard my own. Um, I've heard her heard Copeland's as well. Have a good one. Well, 
What'd he say? Was someone about to burn alive? Really say, have a good one. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the... It's so... It's becoming difficult to feel what the core issue of the story is. What the core question is. What's the question this story is answering? And I think that's something I'm going to come back to. Uh, and I'll write it in here just so I can uh, make sure you don't miss the note. What's the, what's the question this story is asking? Is it about... A friendship? Is it about, you know, the speaker stealing Ophelia while, you know, Cope is mourning? You know, is it about family? Um, hard to sense the focus without the scenes. Yeah, the scenes are so pulled back. They're so abstract. And I think they're they're really good, but they're all getting filtered through the protagonist. We're not able to just, like, have him just literally describe a play-by-play. -play. Like, I looked to my left. Copeland was there. He was frowning. I put on a fake smile. He said, that's really cool, man. Thanks for showing up. You know, I'm not getting that play-by-play. -play. Or, like, you know, I my, put my hands up close to the fire. I felt the heat against my palms. Um, Copeland nodded to me and said, yeah, that's good. We're all, there's so much interiority coming in. There's so much interiority interrupting and giving us all these cues that it's very hard for us to sense, okay, what are the important cues? What are the not important cues? Like there's this father thing and there's the high school injury and, you know, I don't know where that one went. Um, yeah, was this Ophelia that talked? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my lazy wave. Ophelia. So maybe he did steal Ophelia. So did he steal? Rude. Yeah, so I think it's like, it's sort of like, um, maybe dialing down the mystery a little bit. Uh, maybe... No need if the plot is good, you know, dating the grieving guys GF will be interested. No need to hype the two. Yeah, I don't know. I'm guessing that's that's what's going on. It's like he's dating Ophelia. So there's no need, I think, to hype the the reveal too much um i maybe even bring that in earlier because i kind of want to i want to know what's going on so as i see these characters work it out i am interested and i care and it's and it's compelling um so yeah just food for thought there i guess
Okay. Um, all right. A good time before. We didn't say anything at first. Took a seat next to him, joined him in his trance. So we're just kind of staring at the fire together. Copeland said something and didn't catch it. What? Did you go back to school? Yeah, I, I did another semester, but then the money ran out again. I know the feeling. I'll finish eventfully. Good. Hope it works out for you. Again, this is very like Mary Sue dialogue. Um... Yeah, so again, like, you're right in some senses. This is how real people talk. This is how someone dealing with grief and whatever would share with their friend. But the thing that's holding you back here is is the fact that you're, you're forgetting that, remember, this is narrative. This is a story, and the reader is expecting it to sound realistic, but they know that you're going to cut corners to get us to the good parts faster than real life would get us. So they know that you're going to get to conflict. You're going to move forward. So, you know, I've gone about 10 pages in or so, about nine pages. So I'm going to start moving a little faster. I'm going to kind of just kind of go through, just so I can get a sense of maybe the whole story, get a sense for how it ends, and maybe I can give some more notes uh, about the actual uh, arc of it as well. So I'm going to move a little faster. How can, can I ask you something? Sure. Do you know what? I mean, what do you plan on doing with this place? Figured I'd just keep it stay here. Sun dipped. Fire reflected off the windows where glass bent to flames. Thought it would have been like to come across the house. Maybe cope on the sofa to consume that one. Okay. It took me a couple of weeks before I returned to the house again. I decided I'd tell him everything I saw. So yeah, so then this is this about what he saw? So again, this is like a you know, this is a different narrative question. I didn't even realize he was grappling with this. Again, use your interiority to show this conflict, not to, to summarize who each character is or tell backstory. So again, yeah, this is a great example of when, I mean, so one, I'm not sure if maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but I never knew that the character was grappling with, okay, should I tell Copeland everything? Should I just hide about what happened that night with his parents? I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't, I, so that wasn't clearly communicated earlier on. That wasn't set up. And I think the reason that wasn't set up was because your time in the setup was your narrator time, the time when the narrator's thinking, the narrator, we're getting into his thoughts, we're getting into interiority. Um, that time was being spent talking about, you know, his basketball injury and his lazy high five and um, those types of things. So, and funny enough, the lazy high five set up that I think he had a really, I think he probably still had a relationship with Ophelia. That may still be a possibility for the story. I don't know. Um, but this thing, which is coming in over halfway through the novel and is saying, hey, this is something he's been struggling with, I, the reader, have not gotten that sense. And the reason is, is because we've been doing too much telling. That's how you can usually tell where there's not enough showing going on in a story is when the writer is like, oh, yeah, and we've been talking about this the whole time. And the reader's like, what? That's because when when you're telling, it it, it always makes the reader feel less plugged into what's going on. So if you... If you are forced to set up a situation where I am asking in scene one, oh my gosh, like why am I not in scene one wondering like, is he going to tell Copeland what really happened to his parents? Is he going to tell him? I don't know. Like, so like that interior thought needs to be building that conflict if it's going to be one that's going to be, you know, binding the story together. It had been right to know. The sensations were keeping me awake a few nights here and there. Didn't belong to me. They were his, and I was greedy keeping them. It told me, uh, okay, so he feels greedy for 
Some were lifting the scorched marks in the pavement. There was no stench or smoke in the air, but the sky was clear. I wonder if Copeland decided to stop the burning leaves. Turned my radio down and rolled the car. A signal to me my friend had fallen under conscious obsession and ripped from acceptance. When the fire when the fire pit came into view, I saw Copeland's hunched back. He was balling up sheets of newspaper and packing them together. Burning stuff. He sauntered. Um, so like this, um, Okay, so this goes to a good point, um, which is whenever you have a first-person narrator, the adjectives, the adverbs, how they describe the scene makes the reader guess about how they're interpreting what's going on. So by the fact that him says, you know, when I saw the first violent flash of flame appear, that's like, oh, so he thinks something is bad that's going to happen. Like, he's, so this is a violent flash of flame. Maybe he's afraid. But then he saunters up with his hands in his pockets. And then, then I'm like, well, he described the scene, that character. He sees the eye character. So the eye character described the scene as something that had violence in it, as something with a threatening scene. But he's treating it differently. So that's another little break. So remember, how in a first-person narration, how that character is describing the action of the scene can imply, and it also helps you save a lot of time elsewhere because you don't have to have him think about, oh, I was really nervous. You can just say, I saw the violent light ahead. I felt my heart pound. I ducked my head and and took a deep breath uh, and tried to act casual by putting my hands in my pocket. So, like, those are the types of things that can help me just understand how he's relating to what's going on. Are you okay? Yeah, why? It just seems like something's bothering you. No, I mean, I guess I'm worried about you, actually. Why the fires? I think you might be obsessed. Obsessed. Excuse me? You've been having a lot of fires lately. I don't think you're coping with what happened to your parents. Have you ever thought maybe this is how I'm coping? I'm fine. Trust me. I didn't have a fire for the last five days. Before that, the last two were the ones you were here for. Oh, I didn't believe him. He was deflecting, refusing to accept. Are you okay? What? Ophelia stopped by. She wanted to talk. We ended up talking about you. She said you'd been acting pretty strange for a while. That's why. Two nights later, I couldn't sleep. The events. Okay. Let me just read. Instead, I watched two red lights, drove away. When the morning I came, dressed myself, I heard outside. I wanted to show it. I wanted to see the Copeland exactly. But I wasn't sure. Or should we be outside enjoying either the remaining heat of the previous night's fire or a brand new one? So did he stay at Copeland's house? Two nights later. I found that it was hard to see the road in front of me. A haze had come over the land for a moment. I was terrified that Copeland had gone too far and started in front of them engulfing it all. I realized that it was just the remnants of a morning fog, and I drove past Copeland's house and out toward the outskirts of the county. Oh, good. So that's like him, him letting go. Um, yeah, so I feel like the story and, 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 um, yeah, so I like the way that he's like, Hey, I don't need to, to do this anymore, which is, which is great. Um, so that's like a good conclusion. It's him working through his issues, which is in some ways more interesting. So I think to to one one issue I think is that or so I think let me talk about the good. I think um it's really well written. Um good. Uh very well written. The prose operates nicely. This is smooth prose, and it's not something smooth prose is not something I see every day on Final Boss. So well done. 
Um, I like the like the character and the uh, imagery. Love the repetitive fires of Copeland and the uh, improve. Um, focus this story. Um, um, you know, and that can be like, will the narrator realize his own grief at seeing a horror and let go? You know. And then we see, and then like the story. Yeah, um, that's an example. So like, I think we need that focus. And the second thing is I would really, um, I might put some little dashes here too. Um, um, Yeah, so the thing, and this is a really good, important thing to think about here, is we have so much interior thought. Um, I'm just going to add all this stuff here. Um, we have so much interior thought. Um, so one goal for you, I think, uh, as you go into revisions on this story, is to say, okay, I want to trim down all the thought. I want to trim down all the interiority. But uh, the stuff I do leave behind... I want to have when I but when I have interiority it has to be in relation to the narrative question the narrative question which is like will the this this is how I read it at least after this draft which was will the narrator realize his own grief at seeing a horror and let go so the first half of the story he doesn't really know he's grieving and then he kind of is like well maybe I should tell Copeland cuz it was really disturbing uh, and then he, he kind of at the end just lets go, I think. So I think we really need to figure out, and I'm still not sure because there's like all this stuff about Ophelia, but that doesn't ever come in. So that's like one of those things where we have these Chekhov guns. We're saying, hey, we're mentioning Ophelia's name. We're setting this up as important. This is going to be important. And then we never actually fire that gun. Another little issue. So that's where the interiority being focused on the narrative question is important. And before before you go and write another draft, of this or rewrite it or whatever you want to do, you have to, I think, write down what is the narrative question of the story and how will everything in this in this story answer that question one way or the other or or pull me along different lines. We'll say, oh, maybe in the first thing we say, oh, no, he's never going to realize you know, that he's grieving, that he's really hurt him, that he's been really been hurt by what he witnessed. And then later on, we're like, oh, maybe, maybe if Copeland, maybe by working through Copeland's bereavement, he'll figure it out. And then at the end, we're like, yes, he actually did let go. You know, whatever that is, um, we need to have that progression. We need to have that journey. Um, but overall, great work. This was a really well done story. Howdy, Howdy, Santa Willow. Welcome, welcome. Great to see you. Great to see you. We're doing a little edit, which hasn't been done in a while. Or a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks. So we're almost done with our edit queue, believe it or not. Believe it or not, there's one more edit after this, and I will have an empty queue, one thing I haven't had in years. So get excited. And I might do that over Christmas. So I'll finally have cleaned out my queue at long last. It will be a day long remembered. Okay, so I'm going to have to do a little bit of finagling here, so be patient with me here. Bear with me. That's better. 
That'll go there. And then Numpad++ will go here. Oops, then I'm going to zoom it in. There we go. Then I'm going to duplicate this. <laughs> I see some chatting. I'll be on in a second. Um, I will catch up with chat in just a hot minute, so uh, bear with me here. I'm just trying to get my windows set up. Um, but I see your questions. Um, PDF. Uh, And then, oops. Word wrap. All right, sweet. There we go. And then I will go ahead and delete that. All right, okay. Likewise, so for the dialogue part, long remembered, shortly lived. Yes, indeed. There's only two people in a scene, and once you've established you speaking, can you leave dialogue tags off? Or is that every now and then? You absolutely can. You absolutely can. I, I think it, like, because it works. Um, and I, let me go back to my example here in his work. Um, let me go back to that. Um, then I can actually describe kind of what I'm talking about. So y you can. So my only suggestion for adding some tags was just because we never had a starting point. So you can definitely, it's actually ideal. If you can leave dialogue tags off, do it. Um, so for this one, I didn't correct it because it doesn't really, it actually kind of matters who, who talked first in this situation, but since it's the same thing, it doesn't matter that much. Um, but so like, I just needed a benchmark, right? Cause like, I don't know who's talked first. Who's asking who? Cause we've pretty much gotten, I was looking towards the bottom where the surface of the wood had shed its roughly covering of bark of skin and white backed up by the orange combustion deep inside. Still seeing Ophelia. Like, is that, is that. Copeland asking, is that him asking Copeland? I actually, you could play it as actually. Yeah, that's probably right. I, I mean, it probably it might have been Copeland the whole time. No, and this is the main character. This is a speaker. No, we broke up. When did that happen? Not long ago. Too bad. I liked her. Me too. Didn't realize you guys knew each other. Maybe this is, you know, him talking to Copeland, and Copeland's like a little, I guess. Or it could play the other way, which is like, you know, um, you know, him asking Copeland, trying to break the ice. Oh, you still seen Ophelia? Like after the, your bereavement? No, we broke up. But there's not. So that you can either have two things. You can either ind indication, you know. You could also indicate, um, you know, I should write this in. Um, You know, that's a bad example, but like, you know, that's an example. Like, hey, are you still seeing Ophelia after your parents died? Like, and then we know that it's got to be the other person's addressing Copeland. So that's the thing. It just needs to be clear. That's all. It doesn't have to be every line. It's actually better if it's not, but it just needs to be clear on who is saying what, uh, unless there's intentional ambiguity. And then I wouldn't really recommend that unless you really know what you're trying to accomplish with that intentional any time it's always better for especially beginning writers be as clear and upfront don't hide anything don't hide any secrets don't hide any mysteries don't hide who's talking just tell me a story that's what i always tell new writers that's what i tell myself because i'm still learning a lot of this stuff 
only someone who's been doing it and, and who knows kind of what they're trying to accomplish and has some specific goals in mind, then you can start bending things. But I honestly wouldn't recommend it until you get to that point. Uh, anyways, uh, let's go to the other story and then we can talk some more. I'm going to take a quick bathroom break and I'll be right back. Back uh, up to the new the new story, and then again we're going to do uh, at least uh, we'll try to do the first ten pages here, uh, and this is um, TDS. I don't know what that stands for. There's no title page. Um, P1, perhaps add a title page. Not a big deal, but just for me. NBD, but would help. <laughs> uh, all right. Suburban Neighborhood Day. The land is white with snow, deep and undisturbed. In the distance. Should I read it in like a weird, creepy accent? No, that's just going to be annoying. Hold on. Oh, of course, of course. Leaving them off after who is speaking is established. Yeah. Could be the same person talking to himself for all we know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it just comes down to clarity. Clarity, clarity. Every now and then it's going to turn them on. Yep. Agree with Silent Willow. That's absolutely correct. Um, The land is white. In the distance, a gray stream of smoke winds up into the air. In the distance, in the bigger picture, there are several plumes of smoke dying last day. The snowplow growls with determination. Determination. I would, um, ha like the snowplow being determined, yeah. That's so, so, um, not a usually a big deal, but because this is the first line of a, the first page of a screenplay, a little bit problematic, right? In your very first paragraph, or second paragraph. Um, how is a snow uh, and yeah so I think having um Yeah, especially, so that's the thing. Screenplay is a great form for writers to practice in, for even prose writers to practice in, because it is it has to be so concrete. It has to be what's on the page, what's visible, what's audible, what you can dramatize, right? Because it's drama, it's not prose. We can't get into thoughts, we can't in, get into interpretations. So stuff like this, an interpretation, like, so this is a writer's interpretation of what to think about that stimulus of a snowplow growling, right? So an interpretation coming in early is always a little bit problematic because it indicates perhaps for someone who's read a lot of screenplays, because I used to do coverage and stuff like that, and, and you would usually be like, mm, this person's probably, probably a little bit newer to the business. And that's not something you want someone to say on your first page. Um, in the front of a snow-covered building, Three men in parkas and jeans crowd around the open hood of industrial-sized truck. Their breath hangs through the cold air. 
from under the hood a clunk. The tallest of the men is Rick Madden, 46, big as a tree. He slips from a coffee mug and watches the action under the hood. He smiles and shakes his head. Also searching whether he frowns at the engine, he's black and taciturn, but then he smiles. He takes a, decided, takes a decade off his features. Again, these interpretive lines are okay. These, this is when it's allowable as in character description. I personally don't like it, but... Um, he's young. Think it'll run? It'll run. It'll run if I have to die right here working on it. Brian's voice is wheezy and unwell. That's comforting. Who's is Brian? Go stick a fork in it. Go stick a fork in a light socket, old man. Rick smirks. Doug frowns at Brian. What'd you just say to me? I said go fry yourself. Why is he so mean? Because he's sick, I guess. Put your spectacles on and do it. Right now, I dare you. Duck can help us smile. F off, how's my truck? Good as new, should run like the wind. Brian coughs. Blah, blah. Almost for emphasis. I've got a joke. Is it, vul is it vulgar? I've got no interest for vulgarity. No, it's a good one. Brian looks up and smiles. Judy! You want to hear my joke? Judy Madden, older and gray-haired, but also in robust health, joins the group. She looks at Brian pensively. Was she outside? Oh, well. Better not be obscene. Rich puts up his arm around Judy. Are you going to flirt with me, or do you want to hear the joke? It's incredible. Go for it. This better be hilarious. Okay, here goes. You ready? Brian looks at the three others. Moth goes into podiatrist's office. The podiatrist's office says, What seems to be the problem, Moth? The voice struggle is real. <laughs> where, are you be where do I begin, man? I gotta go to work with Gregory Ilyanovich. And all day long I work. Honestly, Doc, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. And I don't even know if Gregory, Gregory Ivan Ivanovich knows. He only knows that he has power over me. That seems to bring him happiness, but I don't know. I wake up in the malaise, and I walk here and there. At night, I sometimes wake up, and I turn to some old lady in bed that's on my arm. Lady that I once loved, Doc. Brian, hold on. It's getting dark. Hold on. So when the moth goes, I don't know where to turn to. My youngest, Alexandria, she fell in the... All the older boy... Oh my gosh, this is getting long. <laughs> okay, so I was initially not going to comment about this huge block of dialogue, but uh, it's it's always really problematic. You'd usually, uh, you know, keep things, keep dialogue short. I was willing to allow the long block... Yeah, and that's the thing. Like, we're before the hook. There has not been a hook yet. I mean, well, what's the hook? There are some people working on a car. So we need to get to the hook big time. And what's the issue is that when you have these long, expansive monologues, and this goes for novels too, and short stories especially, but if you have these long, expansive monologues that aren't really going anywhere, and we haven't gotten to a hook that's really like, here's the narrative question. That's what we're looking for, or a hint. So the goal in a screenplay, the first 10, so from page one, from page one, 
you have to clearly establish not necessarily what the narrative question is, but that there is a narrative question coming. There is a big plot coming from page one. So like this is going to be a little bit like of an obnoxious example, but like in oh my god in Indiana Jones. Think about that. You haven't – in the first scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, you haven't heard about the Lost Ark yet. But you know that there is an adventure coming. They are going through the jungle. He's like, Sh shut up, shut up. There's – like, don't go through the light. You know, like, there's some crazy stuff going down. You know Indiana Jones is a badass, and he's going to go into the craziest situations that you can think of after that first scene. The Raider, The Lost Ark isn't even mentioned yet. But so like yeah, so a lot of it is is the first ten pages are setting up that there is a plot coming, and then once the plot comes on page ten, then it has to just launch. But you have to hint there is a big plot coming. Just you wait, just you wait. And, and I'm not getting even that here just yet. There's just kind of three people talking over a truck. So I think we need a little bit of that, you know, sense of where's the plot. The plots are coming, you know. I mean that's how a lot of um, that's how a lot of you know these I don't know how to say like kind of the pop screenplays do it where where they have um, you know they have like the murder happen and then it goes to the detective that's like a very ham-handed way to do it where they're like oh look they somebody's dead so there's going to be a plot and here's the detective and then you will have ten pages of setup and then we're gonna go on and find the murder so like. That's a little bit more of a ham-handed way to do it, but that they're still accomplishing the same thing, which is page one. There is a plot coming. There is a plot coming. And then once the big hook actually hits uh, in the act one turn, then it, it goes. The voice struggle is real. I know. My voices are not. Brian, hold up. Hold on. It's getting dark. All right. Uh, hold on, damn it. So the moth goes, I don't know where to turn to. My youngest fell cold last year, the colds, and the other boy, my other boy, Gregario, is, I no longer, is he saying moth? I don't know. As much as it pains me to say, when I look at his eyes, I always see the same cowardice that I catch when I take a glimpse of my own face in the mirror. If only I wasn't such a coward, then perhaps to reach over to that cocked gun and end it all. Well, we're young. Oh, this is the other guy. Well, we're young. Hold on. And then Moth says, Doc, sometimes I feel like a spider, even though I'm a moth. I just barely hang out of my web with an everlasting fire beneath me. It's not feeling good. And so the doctor says, Mothman, you're troubled. You should be seeing a psychiatrist. What on earth did you come here for? Oh, that's... And the moth says, because the light was on. Then they break up laughing. Okay, that was pretty good. Uh, so, like, I think one thing that's always kind of like... Telling a joke, and a formalized joke in a story is tough. Because, you know, most time when you're reading a book and you hear a joke, you're kind of like... Hmm. So it's like humor is hard. Humor is one of the hardest things to write. I don't write it because it's so hard. I, I do attempt to write it, but it's like more like the, hmm, yeah, that's funny. Like, you know, so the problem is when you have characters laughing hard, when characters laugh hard at a joke or even the, you know, joke of not laughing at first, then it, you know, feels weird if the reader isn't laughing that hard unless it's you know yeah unless it's ironic unless you're trying to be ironic and I think you kind of are but I, I would really just give that one an extra look uh, the duplex hall moments later the door shuts and Bion doubles over coughing <sighs> Rick. oh sh Oh, crap. Does he need the pen? 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. Rick's the hardcore guy. Judy pounds on the front door and lowers the apartment. Thick thuds. Betray your worry. Brian continues coughing, starting to hack. Sarah, come out if you can hear me. Sarah Hayden comes in the hall. Can you breathe? We're getting a lot of characters. Um, page five. Does he did he overdo it outside? He seemed fine. Brian inhales long and hard and he whoops in an intake, blows out heavily, a few more breaths than he's normal. Barris reaps in his eyes. I'm okay. I'm fine. They don't seem to believe him. A heavy one passes. Not today. Silence so, silent. So, nothing on that. Others leave, exhales in the relief. So it turns the lobby into the snow yard. Breath hangs in the air in the street. Brian sits on a shadow on a snow shadow mobile. A snowmobile. Need a ride, my dear? Oh, it's a Brian. Man, I'm doing all the weird voices wrong. I'm getting all the voices wrong tonight. My comment is still very true. Need a ride, my dear? She smiles and tosses a snowball at him. Do that again, you'll be walking. Yeah, you gosh damn right. Sarah throws another snowball. Brian glares in response. Think you can make me? Try me and see. She chuckles and approaches and Brian wears a fierce look, even as she mounds the chassis. She sits behind mounds. It's supposed to be mounts. Is he on a motorbike? On a snowmobile. Oh, I see. You're lucky I'm a coward. Brian starts the ignition and Sarah jumps. Home, jumps. And, uh, I mean, yeah, it's a snowmobile. I don't know. Um, Some of the reactions, yeah. Uh, the character relationships. Yeah, I'm not getting the sense of impending doom. I need a sense of impending doom early in the story. So bring that in. Bring that in. Interior lamplight night. Snowmobile pearls in front of a squaring building. There used to be a strip mall. Brian is next to three other weather beaten rigs. I don't know what lamplight is, you know, so like that's the thing, like um And you should you should actually cut to a uh So this should be exterior That's a bad example, but whatever, yeah, that's just what I'm trying to say. Brian makes the door in a hurry, watching as Sarah falls. He holds the door open as they enter inside the door as things aren't nearly as bad. Neon lights in the window, casual laughter, okay, so in the bar. Music plays from the speakers. Sarah shakes the snow off her coat, smiles, Brian coughs, but only once. Where he nails and his lungs are clear and clear. Nice, all the music, arena rock. Brian pulls the wool from his head and takes off his coat. Emerson Hill, 65, merges from behind the bar, his beard and grandfatherly. Can I see your guys' ID real quick? 
How about I hack up along on your bar? Soul, what can I get you? Double mug of Paps, Paps BR and a whiskey chaser. Sounds good. I'll give you a Coke back so you don't get hung over tomorrow. So this is, again, this is the same dialogue issue we actually are having in the other book, in the other story, which is this kind of how are you, I am fine dialogue. Uh, this is what we want to kill with conflict. So I'll maybe write, this will probably be what my blog post will be about, is this how are you and how to counter it, because I've seen it so often. Um, but this how are you, I am fine, I want a beer, yes, I'll take a Bud Light. All that dialogue needs to be gone. We need to get to the action. We need to cut to them saying, oh, thanks for the beer. You know, that needs to be gone, gone, gone. Um, so, food for thought. Uh, anyways, back to business. I'm just going to probably do this last little page or two here. Trish go say hi, get a shot, just a shot. So, like, I'm, you know, as a reader, if I was reading this, I would be starting to skim because I'm like, okay, well, when's something going to happen? When's something going to happen? Nothing's really happening. Just one. Heard he was coughing today. Not as bad as you thought. Okay, well, great. Okay, no one seems to be caring about his coughing. And he doesn't even seem to care. So... They all, like, he has, like, this horrible coughing fit. So, like, when the, when the characters don't care, the reader doesn't care. Um, everyone talks about his coughing like it's okay, and he blows it off. Yeah, so because they're all just like, oh yeah, he's coughing, you know, like, and or he's like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. So it's like, once the characters are kind of like trivializing something, um, you know, then, but then the inverse is true, which is also a very powerful device. So if a character, you know, they're like, oh, it's the ring, it's the ring. How did you find? Like immediately, you're like, what ring? What? How the? Why is it so important? So it's like. Making something every character like cares about is a way to generate conflict. And that may be one of the things, you know, um, you know, yeah. So it's sort of like, you know, and this happens in all these fantasy books, you know, it's all made up, you know, it's like, what about the continuum transfunctioner? We have to have it. And everyone's like, oh gosh, we have to get the continuum transfunctioner. You know, and then that builds the conflict because every character cares about it, even if it's make believe nonsense. So remember, don't trivialize your points of conflict. I feel like your your coughing is a point of conflict. That's one of the things that it seems to be driving a story forward. Almost one of the only things, because I'm not seeing much else in terms of something building, right? Um, so, so one is like we'll probably want to get to that story a lot sooner, whatever that story is. Um, but two is when you do have these little hooks of conflict, build them up. Don't undermine them by having everyone be like, oh, it's fine. Be like, maybe he's the only one that thinks it's not. And everyone, and everyone's like, you have to go to the doctor. I don't want you to talk about, no, I'm fine, I'm fine. And he's like, you always tell me what to do. Maybe it evolves into a fight. You know, that's what I kind of am curious to see is like, make this thing, if it's your, if it's the thing, make it a big deal. Um, from a large stereo set, music of the old world. <sighs> you better pay up, you hear me? This one doesn't count. You call it doesn't count if you don't call it. Keep it up, old man. Listen here, old woman. You don't follow the rules. I don't gotta. That the lamplight. Okay. See, I guess we started a new scene here. Uh, one way to do that would be to have later. So rather than continuous, have later. Um. That also because it, it looks like time has passed, right? Unless it's like the exact same thing.
No, this is later. Right? Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, that'll I won't write that in, but something to think about is how to best mark that. Because that doesn't seem accurate. Keep it up, old man. Listen here, old woman. You hear me? Where is my better half? Tobacco is my better half. Well, that was much implied. So it's there's no no development. Nothing is happening. There's not a consequence. No scene has had a consequence yet. Uh, a scene is not a scene without consequence. I'm going to write that in. Not a scene without consequence. You know, if we cut all these scenes out, nothing would change. If we didn't have them, you know, fixing the car, what would change? I need to see the character with a goal in each scene. An obstacle and a consequence of getting or failing to get that goal. This needs to be every scene. Um, but that's something I would really recommend. You gotta have consequences. If you're like, what was the consequence of that? If you can't answer that question at the end of the scene, the scene might not be necessary or it might need to be reworked. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and call it. Um, I think this. I think you have a lot of really good stuff going on. Um, I think the good uh, is you know you have these great characters and great voice voices. They all sound different. Um, I think you know I like the way you describe the world. It feels really vivid and like cold <laughs> yeah like I was like oh it's so cold where's my blanket yeah like it was very good you did a great job evoking the world a great job evoking the world by showing uh, improve um, we need conflict we need conflict surrounding a goal um, whatever the big plot will be. And we at least need to have some big hint about what is coming. You know, screenplays are so economical. They all are focused. They all are narrowed. Um, avoid any how are you I am fine dialogue. This is a momentum killer. Just cut um, any line that, you know, isn't necessary. Cut to them getting a beer. You know, why banter with the bartender where you could just start the scene with them grabbing a beer? You know, remember this is film. You can cut forward, you can cut backward. You have this this quick movement that you have at your disposal as a filmmaker. Um, anyways, that is going to be the show for tonight. Um, that was a little quick edit, but those were both little fun short pieces. I really enjoyed them both. Thank you, writers, for sharing that with us. And to all y'all out there, I mean, uh, these obviously are not a full edit by any means. This isn't what the paid edits are like. The paid edits are much more detailed. Um, but these are kind of a little example of sort of the, the types of notes you'll, you might you might receive. Uh, and this is obviously more instructive because it's free and this is hopefully for everybody to, to learn and develop as a writer. Uh, so... If you all want me to edit your work, send your work to finalbossediting at gmail.com. Um, and I'll do uh, edits. Put that in the chat there. Uh, and there's an example of a development edit we did um, on a screenplay a little while back. Um, so that link on the box is that one as well. And then it looks like FinalBot is also going to chime in and tell people to follow us on Facebook. So do that. Uh, also, if you go to our website, finalbossediting.com, uh, you can put your email in and do that, and then whenever I do an edit like this and I write up some summary notes about some of the takeaways, you'll be able to get it all. So do that, and you'll be happy. Uh, anyways, folks, that's the show. Thanks for watching, and have a great night.